Good afternoon. Welcome to the Los Angeles County Office of Education Safe and Welcoming Schools Professional Development Live Webinar Series. I am Dr. Janice Phelps, one of the directors here at LACO, and today we are so fortunate to have two presenters from the Urban Assembly, David Adams and Brandon Frame. They will be focusing on the topic of all learning is social and emotional. So now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Jewel Forbes, who will introduce both David Adams and Brandon Frame. Jewel. Thanks, Janice. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And so now just a little bit of information about our wonderful speakers for this afternoon. David Adams. David is the Chief Officer of the Urban Assembly. He started with the Urban Assembly in 2014 as the Director of Social Emotional Learning, where he created Resilient Scholars Program, RSP, a unique approach to integrating SEL into curriculum and classroom practices across UA networks. RSP has grown into, national, to a, into a national program serving schools and districts in Los Angeles, Houston, Syracuse, and other cities. As the Senior Director of Strategy, David led the expansion of the organization into a mobile, uh, excuse me, a model provider of school support with an emphasis on innovation and equity in public education. In 2021, David received the Champion of Equity Award from the American Consortium for Equity in Education. David sits on the board of CASEL as an author of the Educator's Practical Guide to Emotional Intelligence and a co-author of the textbook, Challenges to Integrating Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Programs in Organizations. He is a Civil Affairs Officer in the Army Reserve and holds a Master's in Education and Educational Psychology from Fordham University. And we'd also like to welcome Brandon Frame. Brandon Frame is a visionary leader, social innovator, and educator. He is the founder and chief visionary officer of the Black Man Can, Inc., an award-winning nonprofit that amplifies the stories of what Black men and boys can do. Accomplishments and accolades are no stranger to Brandon. But what makes him extraordinary is the humility and servant leadership that makes that marks his life. Brandon Frame is the Director of Social Emotional Learning at the Urban Assembly, where he leads a team to work with districts and schools around implementation, integration, and sustainability of social emotional learning. Brandon is also the co-founder of the award-winning Twitter chat, Hip Hopped, and the author of Define Yourself, Redefine the World a guided journal for boys and men of color, and the children's book, My, Fa My First Tie. Um, for his service to this community, Brandon has received the Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major Award, Change Maker of the Year, and he was named next in class in the field of education by Black Entertainment Television. Brandon's work has been featured in Black Enterprise, Boston Globe, Essence, and he has appeared on CBS, NBC, ABC, HLN, and NY1 as New Yorker of the Week. Brandon pursues excellence with impeccable effort in all that he does. He is currently a doctoral candidate at Boston University and also a graduate, a graduate of Morehouse College and resides in the Bronx, New York. Welcome, gentlemen. We're so excited to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having us. We are so excited to be here. Um, and what's so great is that I know since we are in Laco, Los Angeles County, that means that we're in the, the county of champions. Uh, and uh, as you have just celebrated a, a Super Bowl, and, and even in the last few years, you've seen the Dodgers and the um, Lakers bring home a title. But what's even even better is that I'm with educators that are champions. Right, because you wake up every day to do this work um, across Los Angeles County. So again, truly honored to be here with you um, with uh, champions uh, around education who really believe in social emotional learning. 
And Brandon, um, before so. you get too started, would you would you mind uh, checking out to see who's in the chat? I know we got 65 participants. Can yes. We take a minute or two just to see where people are hailing from. I heard you're hailing yeah. from Morehouse. I see, I see. I see some Morehouse uh, Star Sterling Cox in the building. Uh, Morehouse stand up. So those, yeah, let us know where we where, where you are checking in from. What part of Los Angeles County? Uh, maybe name your school. Uh, we want to get that pride going. Uh, that 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 where you do your championship work. Uh, where are you representing uh, your championship work from? Uh, San Diego, um, Pomona Unified School District, Santa Clarita Valley, East LA. East, well, East LA, uh, we got Pasadena. Pasadena. El Segundo. Awesome. Dorothy Go Rams, it looks like somebody went to the, uh, to the, holly, to the uh, parade. We got Compton in the house. Yes, we do. North Hollywood. Santa Clarita. Oh, oh man, now they're coming in. We got Antelope Valley High School District right there. You see that B-frame? Oh, on the check-in. Glendale, California on the check-in. All I'm right. Loving we'll I'm loving we'll it. North Hollywood in the house. Let's do it. Let's do it. Carson, California. Sequoia Grove Charter School. Antelope Valley High School District. So this is this is amazing uh, to see all of you here. We're really happy to be with you. I know that the weather is probably much nicer where you are than it is here, much warmer. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we're gonna make sure that we keep it warm here and on our Zoom um, as we talk about social emotional learning. Um, so let's go to our next slide. So again, Brandon Frame, Director of Social Emotional Learning, I'm here with David, and, and I'm gonna let David introduce himself. Uh, but really, what I'm most interested, David, is tell me a little bit about the shirt that you have on. You mean uh, this shirt? Looks really dope. This shirt? This shirt. That shirt. Oh man! And this is our SEL Day shirt. We're gonna talk about how all learning is social and emotional. Uh, and we're going to exchange some knowledge here today. You heard Brandon's biography. You know a little bit about myself. But what you may not know is on March 11th, SEL Day is something that you all can take part of. So go to selday.org and you can sign up to promote, amplify, showcase SEL. If you're doing social emotional learning in your school or you want to do social emotional learning in your school, make sure you go to selday.org so that you can participate in the things that we're talking about today. Here's an SEL Day shirt. Uh, you can also get an SEL Day shirt, but you can also make your own. So really excited! Thanks for asking me, Brandon. I didn't I, I didn't know you would ask me about my shirt. You know, I just slipped this I thing on. on. I was, oh man! You and, uh, it looks it looks great. I'm like I can't wait to get mine. So thank um, you, brother. Thank you so much. Right in what we're talking about. So uh, we'll go to our next slide. So when we for to get started today, we want to ground ourselves, right? And I think what I find is that when we ask people, you know, what is social emotional learning? We actually get a lot of definitions. It does mean a lot of different things to a lot of people and a lot of different communities. Um, but what's the definition and what's the way to move us forward in terms of a definition that can bring us all together? So our guiding definition around this work is this one here. Social emotional learning is the process through which children and adults, that's essential there, children and adults, we are all going through this process. Uh, children and adults develop the skills, attitudes and values necessary to understand and manage life tasks, such as cognitive learning, forming relationships, and the flexibility to adapt to challenges and expectations of a complex society, Maurice Elias, 1997. So what, what I want you to do right now is in the chat, uh, whenever you see that little symbol there, that would mean we're prompting you to talk into the chat. Um, what elements in the above definition are most essential to learning? So I'm gonna give a minute or so just to see some responses come through the chat. But looking at this definition, um, what, is, what, is the most, what is the most essential to learning? Um, or even thinking about how, has, how does this definition reflect where we are as a country in terms of COVID, right? And everything that we've been dealing with. Well, uh, Brandon, you got some folks in the chat answering. Uh, Karen said flexibility. Anna said attitudes. Rebecca said relationships. Uh, Maria said attitudes. Vanessa adapt to challenges. Uh, Jay Myung, uh, differentiation, uh, crystal developing skills, attitudes, and values from our own Dr. Janice Phelps. Uh, we got Malika, both as children and adults. You got a lot of things come in here. Flexibility seems to be the most one that people are talking about. And I, and I love that. I really appreciate um, everybody's engagement during our, our, our webinar because we're going to have a lot of more engagement as we push through. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So all those are really essential, all the different pieces, right? And so when we think about this, we think about this is intentional and explicit skill development, right? When we think about one thing I want you to walk away with as we go through our presentation today is that we're talking about 
these self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, social management, these are skills. These are skills that our young people can develop, right? And need to develop. But it also thinking about that definition, those are skills that we are constantly developing, right? But if we develop these skills, how much different may life be, right? If we are working on those skills in our schools alongside academics, right? Alongside climate and culture and, and, and where we're going. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today, explicit and intentional skill development. What is, that is what social emotional learning and how it intersects in different things inside of our schools and inside of our communities. Next slide. So today's agenda, uh, we're gonna break down and go into SEL in, in four different areas. We're gonna start with social emotional learning and academics. Right, because that's essential when we think about our schools today and how we can integrate the two. SEL and school climate, SEL and mental health, and last, definitely not, certainly not least, SEL and equity. Today's agenda, we're gonna go deep dive into these areas and talk about them, the theory behind them, but also provide the practical application, which then you'll be able to do afterwards through the study guides that are provided for you, um, all, all four of these areas. Next slide. So we'll start with SEL and, uh, and academics. And so this makes me think about uh, Ms. Wright. And when I was in, this is from high school, as you can see, I've always had the million dollar smile, it's a thing. Um, and I went to high school in Connecticut, uh, Windsor High School. And when I was thinking about this presentation, it had made me think about Ms. Wrightman because I was ninth grade, new school, and I had all these different teachers. Um, and in some classes I excelled more than others, but in Ms. Wrightman's class, she ensured that every student participated. She fostered the connection to the world around us. This enabled me to flourish. And then I had other teachers and it maybe wasn't necessarily that, that type of interaction. It was a little bit more lecture based. These are just what I remember. Um, the interactive nature of learning tells us that learning takes place in a social and emotional context. And it's our job to leverage that. So next slide. So what I learned through that experience is that we learn through connection, right? It is those connections that really guide us um, in terms of teaching. If we all sit and just think about what was my best year of teaching, right? You think about that best year, you can talk about those connections you made, right? Through learning, right? Through the content, but you made the connection with the student. And then even if you think back, who's that one teacher for yourself? That one teacher that, you know, that was that ninth grade teacher, that 10th grade teacher, that sixth grade teacher, what was it, right? And you're gonna also probably feel like I do, that connection that, uh, that he or she made with you. Um, so we know that people don't learn in disconnected pods or where information is disconnected. It's not how learning works. So let's talk about that today. So go to our next slide. So first, I wanna, again, we're gonna do this in the chat. How in your role as an educator, have social interactions and emotions played a role in how students learn? I'll look for some few responses in the chat. Um, again, how in your role as an educator have social interactions and emotions played a role in how students learn? And I'll just give a, give a few seconds before we move forward to see some responses in the, in the chat. Well, you got some things coming in right away, B-Frame. Uh, we got Valencia. She says that students seem to respect you more if they feel like they're listened to, to you or by you. Uh, we got Christina. She says in, in student engagement goes up uh, with regards to emotions. Anna, building confidence. Krista, uh, or Kristen, excuse me, create connections with students. Um, we got folks talking about uh, folks really struggle to learn until that caring emotion uh, relationship is established. Karen is saying that they feel good about themselves, the kids, they, they're more capable. Uh, we got maybe 20 more in here. I can go two or three. Krista says kids need to be uh, loved and support, uh, supported. And Carla, ensured wellness over academics increases readiness. Joel, relationships are important. Grace, I help parents understand uh, better and help students. Maybe just two more here. I'm going to uh, go to the end. Lola says a safe environment. Tanya says students are more comfortable, tend to participate more. And Catherine says when my adult students and I connect as parents in family life, it impacts their social and emotional and academic outcomes. Amazing. I really appreciate the level of engagement. Um, and what I can also see is the dedication uh, to, to young people in Los Angeles County. So we're gonna go to our next slide. So what I wanna start with is the theory behind everything that we're talking about. 
right? Because in the study guide, there's going to be more in terms of the activities, but let's let's center ourselves around the theory behind this um, so that we can use it to amplify everything that we're talking about right now in our schools and our community. So it brings me to Vygotsky. He's a Russian scholar uh, from uh, the 1900s, and he developed the zone of approximal development. And so as you can see on the slide, what that looks like is there's what is known, we can all relate to things that we know, and there's what is not known, right? And, and what's in between, that's called, that's learning. But what this also denotes is that learning can be frustrating because skills that are too difficult to master, thinking about social emotional learning skills, right? We're teaching these skills, skills that are too difficult to master for, uh, for his or her um, on his own, that can only be done with the guidance and encouragement of a knowledgeable person. That's me and you. And then in 2022, it could also be you too. But that is me or you. We are that knowledgeable person that helps the student navigate the zone of approximate development. But what we have to really channel here is that in our classrooms right now, that's happening, but learning can be frustrating. Let's go to the next slide. So as we think about that, we think about what Vygotsky was talking about here. And so the distance between actual development as determined by independent problem solving and the level of potential development as determined through the problem solving under adult guidance or in collaboration with more capable peers, right? This is what is happening in our classrooms. We are trying to teach math or science, history, foreign language, right? But it can be challenging, it can be frustrating. And it is on us to actually think about how do we help students navigate themselves through the zone of approximate development? Because it has to be the presence of someone with knowledge and skills beyond that of a learner, yourself, social interactions with a skillful tutor that allow the learner to observe and practice skills, self-awareness, self-management, um, and scaffolding or supportive activities provided by the educator or more competent peer to support that student as they led through the zone of approximate development. So again, I want you to think, and let's go into the chat real quick, during this pandemic, how have you experienced the discomfort of the zone of approximate development? And who helped you facilitate that movement through the zone of approximate development. I look forward to seeing uh, some thoughts in the chat here. Well, before we get to that, uh, Dr. Catherine Taylor Brennan has said that as a district administrator, uh, she models for site administrators how to support the SEL needs of others with intentionality. So just shout out to our modelers, our folks who uh, show what right looks like. You guys are on that, Brennan? Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taylor. That is exactly, and I think that speaks exactly to the definition that we grounded ourselves in, in terms of this is both for students and adults, right? And then we have to think about as adults, how we are modeling that and working on those skills so that we can model them. So I thank you for raising that up. I wanna amplify that. All right, the, the, the answers are coming in right now, Be frame. Um, look, uh, the question was around uh, the zone of proximal development. Karen said that she struggled with being able to give 100% to learning at uh, to learning or teaching at home and class kids at the same time. So mm -hmm. she was teaching in hybrid, and that was really a struggle for her moving through that zone of proximal development. And we appreciate her vulnerability coming in here. Um, Dr. Newman said she feels ineffective and still working on how to navigate through that zone, right? That, that space of where she is versus where she needs to be with that supportive uh, peer. So we're not getting like a thousand on this right now. You know, it was a little bit of a vulnerable question, uh, but folks are getting out here. Um, we have uh, uh, Miss Solo Rosano. She says she's entering a phase where they're accustomed to being in control and being able to plan and then having no control and constantly changing information, which seems like the last two years. I don't know how you felt about that, Brennan. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think many of us can relate to that for sure. Uh, we got uh, Valencia, and she's wondering what it means by social interactions with a skillful tutor that allows learner to observe practice skills. So she she would love to get some more information on that. And uh, lastly, Rebecca said she had to learn how to develop teachers via Zoom, and capital T H A T. That was hard, and she failed a lot. So I know that was a little hard to to really be vulnerable and open that up. So. Props to those who are, are sharing right now, be frank. Absolutely, I, I really appreciate that. I think, uh, to uh, what does it mean by social interactions? So those are the interactions that uh, teachers and students are having with each other um, that allow for 
the activation of social emotional learning skills uh, so that students can learn. And so it's thinking about um, what were we doing as educators to activate social emotional learning skills so that students can practice and learn the things that we uh, would like them to learn um, so that they can navigate the frustration that they may uh, that they may be receiving. So actually we're gonna build on that in the next slide. So if we go to the next slide here. So how does SEL play a role in everything that we are talking about, right? So here, first, we want to ground ourselves in that all learning occurs in a social context and so and with social interactions. And all learning invokes emotional reaction. So let's look at this bar graph here, right? And think about how social emotional learning plays a role and how we build relationships with students, right? So you have performance um, on one, and then we have our, our X and Y axis here. And so as you look at this bar graph, right? Think about as you navigate the zone of approximate development, where, where you may have fallen, whether you were in school, how your students may feel, right? Bored, interested on one side, on the other side, anxious, uh, fear, panic, choke, right? Because the content may be challenging, right? And so we, our goal, though, is that we want, where do we want students to be? We want them to be at excitement the best and optimal state for performance and for learning, right? And so as we think about building relationships and as we think about teaching our content, we have to think about how are we helping students activate their social emotional skills so that they can bring themselves back to the level of excitement that they need in order to learn or also just the optimal state so that when they get frustrated, they're no longer frustrated or how do we move them from bored to excitement? And so that's where social emotional learning plays a role in all of, in terms of learning, right? Because again, if we think about our definition and then going in, it can be frustrating to learn the different contents that we're teaching, right? I remember my own experience as I shared what it was like in one class as opposed to another, but at, in 2005, or that was actually 2001, and in that class, I didn't know that it was called social emotional learning at the time. I've just constantly thought about that, um, which allows me to be in, in where I'm at now, but it's been that 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 teacher invoked social emotional learning skills inside of me that helped me learn. And so that's what we're looking to do now um, and what we should be doing as we work with, with our students across Los Angeles County and across the country, thinking about how social emotional learning plays a role in academics. So we'll go to the next slide. So what does this mean for us as educators? So as we're thinking about our, our lessons, as we're thinking about our instructional practices, what can we do to create tasks and scaffolds that allow students to navigate the zone of approximate development through optimal social interactions, right? So when we think about instructional practices such as turn and talks, we think about Socratic seminar and the list goes on of different instructional practices that you use, how can we help them actualize these uh, so, uh, instructional practices so that they can help students learn um, and actually make sure that instructional practice will do what we want it to do so that they can learn the material. And how we must teach students to navigate and manage their own emotions in order to facilitate their learning. And so in the, in the study guide, there's gonna be activities that will allow for you to actually go in and think about, okay, if I'm using this particular instructional practice, what social emotional skills would a student student need in order to uh, be able to be activated in order for a student to um, make sure that this instructional practice works? Where may have students been pre-taught the social emotional skill that you are activating? And what scaffolding would we put together in order to allow for the social emotional learning to come out for that instructional practice? So that's a lot of the work that's going to happen in your study guide but we're giving you the theory and the basis around this work and how social emotional learning actually integrates with academics um, so that we can help students learn and move and learn the material that they, what we would like them to learn in the classroom. So that's our, our, our basis around um, SCL and academics. In the study guide, you'll see all the different activities that are available for you to actually try to put this into practice uh, tomorrow in your classroom. Um, and with that, we'll go to the next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to David Adams. Thanks so much, Brendan. And I learned a lot about this notion about uh, social and emotional learning, the, the zone of proximal development, uh, this idea of instructional formats and activating social and emotional skills. And I was in the chat, man, and I heard it was snowing in L.A. 
And I'm always surprised, man. You know, maybe just last week here in New York, it was snowing, but I understand tomorrow is going to be like 60 degrees. Um, and I'm always struggling to figure out this, this idea about the climate and, and how we understand it. And even more so when we think about the climate of the entire world. And so when I look at the, the, the global climate, I'm always wondering, like, how did scientists figure out that the earth is warming or, or how, how all these things are interacting? And so next slide, please. I took a little minute and uh, I had some time on my hands as CEO, Brandon, you know, uh, I get a lot of time to just sit around and wonder about things. Um, and so I looked this up, man, and, and it turns out scientists look at three main elements when uh, they're looking at the global climate. They're looking at space, what's happening up above. Uh, they're looking at the atmosphere, what's happening just a little bit above that. And surprisingly, they're looking at the ocean, like what's happening below. And so uh, you've got currents, you've got uh, air and clouds, and you got uh, what's happening in space. And, and basically, what they do is they measure the interactions between all these different elements, the space, the atmosphere, and the ocean. And I started to wonder, you know, how does this global climate idea relate to what we need to do in schools? And so I looked up this uh, definition of school climate, next slide, and it came up from the National School Climate Center. And uh, school climate defines the quality and character of a school, and it's based on patterns patterns, you know, this notion of interactions of uh, parents and school personnel of school life it reflects norms, goals, interpersonal relationships, teaching and learning practices, just like we talked about, and organizational structures. It's five or six areas that we're looking at here, norms, values, and expectations, people being engaged and respected, students and families working together, educators modeling, just like we saw Dr. Teller in the chat, and each person contributing to the operations of the school. So it turns out that when you look at the global climate, there are these three elements. You got the atmosphere, you got the space, and you got the ocean. And when you look at school climate, they're talking about this notion of patterns. And so came up with a little bit of a model just for LA County uh, to, to model this idea of the relationship between social emotional skills and school climate. Next slide. And you can see this is based on the same idea of how global climate is oriented. Uh, up on top, you've got school norms, values, and expectations. And, and that kind of represents the atmosphere and space, like what's happening in the larger context? How are we understanding ourselves? And below on the ocean, you got the currents. Uh, and in this way, we talk about social and emotional skills. And Brandon already talked about that definition, so I won't double down on it. Uh, but these two things interact Right? And you can see all these arrows, they interact to create school climate, how we understand what it is. But one model is not just good enough for me. Next slide. Let's break this down a little bit more uh, in depth so we know what we're talking about. So up on top, remember we had the atmosphere and we had space. Uh, in our school climate model, we're talking about school norms, values, and expectations. So norms are shared identity, right? Who are we together as a school community? Values are what we care about together. Uh, what do we care about, Brandon? What are the things that grounds us at the Urban Assembly? Things like accountability, things like excellence, love, right, innovation. Those are the things we care about together. And then we got expectations, consistent and persistent. And these are the things that represent that upper tier of school, uh, school climate and interact with, next slide, our social and emotional skills. Now, Brandon went around this already, so I'm not gonna double down on this too hard, but remember we've got self and social interpersonal skills, social, how we relate to others, intrapersonal skills, self, how we relate to ourselves, awareness, knowledge, management, doing, self-awareness, social awareness, so self-management, social management, and this uh, determines our social and emotional skills. But let's break these down so we know what we mean by the interpersonal aspects of this in the context of school climate. Next slide. Well, here are the interpersonal skills that we're gonna talk about that have a relationship to school climate. Social awareness, I care, demonstrate awareness of the role and value of others in a greater community. Students demonstrate awareness of other people's roles, their emotions and their perspectives. Students demonstrate considerations for others and a desire to positively contribute to the community. And adults around me share me how to care about others and contribute to bettering my community through their actions and opportunities to provide. Uh, we also have social management, things like uh, effective communication and social skills, uh, developing constructive relationships, 
and the ability to prevent, manage, and resolve interpersonal conflict. So if you imagine these young people and adults just walking around with effective communication skills, like, man, Brandon, your relationship skills are looking very nice today, if I do say so myself, right? So these young people are just doing their thing, right? And, and they're preventing, managing interpersonal conflicts and what emerges from all those interactions, just like that global climate is an effective and supportive school climate. We've got expectations, but if the kids don't have the skills to meet those expectations, it's not gonna work. If the kids have the skills, but no expectations, they don't know how to deploy them. But when you do skills and expectations, then you have a positive school climate. Next slide. Next slide. So at the end of the day, interactions matter. Just like space, atmosphere, and ocean interact to create global climate. Next slide. School norms, values, and expectations interact with social emotional skills to create school climate. If you want to learn more, go into your pack and you'll see all the different materials that we've provided, some research, some opportunities that will go into this some more for you. Now, uh, now that we've talked about the school climate, now that we've understood the kind of social and emotional skills, uh, let's get back to the individual students and talk about the relationship between social emotional learning and mental health. Brandon, I think that's your part. Thank you so much, Dave, for kicking it back. Um, I really appreciated your interplay there, um, thinking about social emotional learning and school climate um, and, and, and how you did that. I was, that was uh, really insightful. I really appreciated that. I and mean, I know that everyone uh, watching uh, did as well. And so I'm excited to move us into social emotional learning and mental health. Um, I know that this is a area that many people think about and talk about um, when it comes to uh, where we are right now in, in our society and how these two things interplay together. So we'll go to our next slide. And so uh, when I was thinking about this, um, we wanna move from isolation uh, to connection, right? And I thought about uh, David Hobbs, who's a consultant, and he said, we often talk about how students need a consistent and connected environment, and that's true. But you, everyone here too, also need that as well in your communities. A, because you deserve it. And B, because when adults consistently align, work and focus on well-being, students experience a coherent and organized environment. And this is especially true around mental health. We can't have positive mental health outcomes without social emotional skills. I want to say that again, I think I would, that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a statement that I think is really important for us to hone in on. We can't have positive mental health outcomes without social emotional skills, and we can't teach social emotional learning without impacting positive mental health. And since this is such an important undertaking, all adults in a children's life have to come together to make this work. So today, uh, in, in our brief time together, we're going to talk and align our, organize our practices to better connect mental health and SEL and reinforce that developing our students' positive mental health is all our responsibility. Uh, next slide. So first, what I'd like to, for you to do is to drop in the chat is, uh, when in the last year or two have, has it been, uh, when in the last year or two was difficult to deal with um, and how did you cope? And where and how did you develop that coping skill? So what in the last year or two was difficult to deal with and how did you deal, um, how did you cope and where and how did you develop that coping skill? And again, from even from before to now, I appreciate the vulnerability that people are sharing uh, when they do drop into the chat um, to answer some of the questions that we're asking. Well, Brendan, uh, we got Carla, she came right out the gate and she says, I'm happy to talk about some of my challenges. Uh, Carla Nunez, she said, uh, balancing work, life and personal responsibilities. And I know, man, uh, that's something we all struggle with. Absolutely. Carla's back, finding new passions. She started swimming in the mornings. Oh, I love that. I, I wish I, I've been I've been trying to find a swimming pool. Um, that's that's my thing right there. I appreciate that, Carla. Uh, Gerardo said, preparing and developing PD for the first time. That's near and dear to our hearts, man. We're working with our SEL specialists to make sure they're right and right and ready to go. Absolutely. Uh, Catherine, I think we'll do one more, says she's teaching her social skills to her seven-year-old at home, and he's bursting at the seams with all of his emotions. And I got an eight and a nine-year-old, and uh, man, I can appreciate that. I appreciate the vulnerability that everyone's sharing and, and, and coming out. So we're going to go to um, our next slide. And so first, let's just center ourselves around some numbers here when it comes to 
uh, so uh, too, in terms of mental health, right? And one is what's important is that it's not the most severe illnesses that most impacts the country. Here we see one in five adults experience mental illness um, each year. One in 20 US adults experience uh, serious mental illness each year, but one in six US youth, US youth age six to 17 experience a mental health disorder. 50% uh, of all lifetime mental illness begins by age 14 and by 75% by uh, 24, 75% by age 24, right? So this, this is all really important data to share. And so a widely cited meta-analysis from 2011 previously showed that it's SCL programs uh, immediately improve mental health outcomes, um, the social skills and academic achievement. Uh, the current study shows that school-based SEL interventions continue to benefit students for months and even years to come, right? So SEL participants were le uh, less likely to have clinical mental health disorders even 20 years later, right? So we're showing these numbers because it's important to note that it's social emotional learning programs and outcomes and how we integrate it into school climate, how we integrate it into academics can help improve um, outcomes, uh, mental health outcomes for our young people by focusing on these skills. I will go to the next slide. And so as we think about that, um, there's our, our, our language, our guiding definitions. We've already really gone over the social emotional learning definition, uh, but here we have the mental health uh, definition. And it's important right here, one of the main reasons we're using this mental health definition is because positive mental health means being able to do what you do, typically do, and successfully being able to do whatever you define as success or as a goal. So we wanted a definition of mental health that was not just what was what, that was not just the absence of disease or turmoil, but that's why we often say positive mental health today in order to remind us of just that. We're not introducing. Uh, so go to our um, click um, right there. So where do you see your skills most in concert with the above definitions? Well, Brandon, I can tell you, um, we have uh, Jay Meng who talked about uh, reading students' facial uh, expressions from his last, um, from the last question, and uh, want to give our support out to Dr. Newman, whose mother was battling with cancer and she was coping by prayer, happy hour, and family. So, uh, giving her some love and support over over Zoom here tonight uh, for some of the challenges that we're all facing, but her uh, uh, in in specific. Definitely, thank you. Keep keep uh, keep you and your family in our prayers. Absolutely, we'll go to our next slide. So, thinking about that to build off that kind of question, but think even more deeply into your own community. How do SCL and mental health and the interplay between them show up in your community? Who is responsible for which work? What does it look, sound, and feel like when positive mental health thrives in your community? And we'd love to have a few people share. Um, their thoughts on any one of these questions. And both are just typing in the chat now. So I think we'll wait a couple minutes or seconds uh, and we'll be able to get some good responses and good comments here. But I know as a school counselor, uh, my wife is somebody who really uh, has invested in that space and, and supports and not only me uh, and my family, but also young people. Um, Jewel is up in the chat and she said mindfulness and round tables and um, Anna said her no his her community is thriving when they're engaged in activities and Kristen says kindness and understanding. Uh, Dr. Newman is back and she's talking about the best cop coping skills are the ones who are responsible for others and showing others the way. It's talking about leading from the front. They will do two more. Uh, Carla said, uh, we can only learn more in a place of ease and contentment. So everyone's responsible for this work. And it's important with every relationship that we have. Maybe mm -hmm. we just take one more response for you, B-Frame, when that one comes in. Awesome. No, I'm, I'm loving these uh, responses. Um, and I see uh, Sharon has shared skills to take into the future. Um, and Catherine, as a parent and teacher, calm down cards seem to help um, empathize. Absolutely. I, I, what I, what I want to impress upon everyone is what we're talking about so much is these are skills. And we, have, we should own that we can help our young people develop skills to do all these things. Right? They're not, I, for me, I, sometimes I think about when I was in school um, um, and even as growing up, things, these are things that 
you either just learn through experience, whereas like, no, we can be intentional and explicit. When we think about social emotional learning, we're talking about intentional and explicit skill development in all these areas. Let's go to our next slide. So an exemplar, as we think about this, and so people share different um, coping uh, strategies they may have shared in your study pack, you have uh, a sheet that has a, a various healthy coping strategies, right? So one that actually was shared was developing routines, right? And there's a description there um, around what is developing routines. But let's think about the questions we should ask ourselves as educators that we should think about as we're helping students develop positive coping skills that help them deal with mental health challenges through social emotional learning. So we would have here, for example, let's think about the idea of developing routines. And the question that we may ask ourselves is, what SEL indicators, right, need to be activated for students and or adults to successfully develop this coping strategy, right? These skills can be the foundation to develop the strategies that we need to, to battle the different challenges and the trauma that we face in life, right? Second question, where have students and or adults been supported to develop these above identified skills, right? And so again, when we think about this, this is gonna be something that all of us take part in, right? Not just the social worker or the counselor, but all of us, if we're helping students develop social emotional skills, we can help, we can think through coping strategies that students may need to deal with things that go on, go on in their life, in their community, but also in the classroom, right? And so as you see this common thread of skill development, for mental health, school climate, um, academics. And so with that, I'm gonna move into our last point um, uh, and last topic of SEL and equity and turn that over to David Adams. Well, thank you so much, Brennan. Um, the, the notion of mental health uh, is something that's real important right now. I know a lot of folks are struggling and teachers are struggling and educators are struggling. Um, and so I really appreciate the time that you took to make those connections between mental wellness and social and emotional skills. Uh, what I'm going to do now is talk uh, not about mental health, but about being together in community um, in equity. And in order to do that, I am going to tell a story. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, me and Brandon, we both work at the Urban Assembly. And uh, every now and then, especially prior to the pandemic, uh, we'd take everybody out and we would be in a great meal and have a couple of drinks, but uh, something would kind of happen at the end. And uh, that's that a lot of people would leave, uh, but not everybody would pay. And, and so we would try and figure out, well, how are we gonna split this bill? How are we going to uh, equitably uh, make sure that everybody has done what they can um, so that we can stay in community as a staff at the Urban Assembly? Next slide. Now, we, we've always had a couple of options. We could go back the next day and come down with an itemized checklist and say, all right, who had the uh, London Mule and uh, who had the three Coronas, but uh, that has some strengths and challenges. Uh, we could just have the bill and split it out equally, uh, but then the person who came in for 10 minutes and left with the water may feel some way about that. Um, uh, or we could just say, you know, the last person who was there, they should have gotten out first. You know, uh, if, you, if you got stuck with the bill, you know, that's on you. Next time, uh, you got to get out first and leave the last person there to pay the entire thing. Uh, but we, we came up with some ideas about how to navigate some of these questions. Next slide. And we did so based on this notion of community. Now, community wasn't just a sitcom uh, of the early 2015 era. Uh, community is a notion, it's an idea. It's this idea that we are looking to reflect our shared values and identities um, and our networks that bond each other through a commitment of reciprocity and the willingness of individuals to act through the common interests. And so when we started talking a little bit about community, uh, we didn't feel so good about leaving the last person who had been at the bar with the largest tab. Uh, we, we started to think about this notion of reciprocity and uh, what the common interest was and what the common interest is. And so we started to actually think a little bit more about this notion of common interest. Next slide. You see, because the common good uh, are these facilities, whether material or cultural or institutional, that the members of a community provide to all members in order to fulfill a relational obligation that they have to care for certain interests that they have in common. So as members of the urban assembly, we have some bonds here that we're trying to, to connect and to protect. 
and uh, we have some relational obligations um, to take care of each other. And as we started to think through these things, uh, we figured maybe we, maybe we should talk to the director of social emotional learning, Brandon Frame. And Brandon, he came back to us and said, David, I have a solution for this challenge of how to split this bill. It's called social and emotional skills. And he showed us this little box, next slide. You see, he said there are self and there are social awareness skills that I think may come to play in helping us to decide what to do with this frequent issue of how to divide the bill at the bar. Next slide. And, and specifically, he focused on this notion when we spoke about social awareness, right? And he said there's this notion of a desire to consideration for others and contribute to our community, in this case, the Urban Assembly. And he even brought us closer and he said, David, there are some skills here. And uh, it's about 4C, being able to uh, prevent, manage, and resolve interpersonal conflicts in constructive ways. And, and Brandon said, you know, there are constructive ways and there are destructive ways, but I think if we learn some of these skills and practice them, we can get constructive and solve this question of how to, to split the bill equitably from the restaurant. Next slide. And I, and I was listening to Brandon, because I'm the CEO and I got to listen to my directors. And I said, Brandon, man, you know, this conversation about what we do uh, to split the bill at, at the bar and the skills that we use to do so, man, it really reminds me of what we're trying to do as a country and as a community. Because my dad likes history and I'm the army and, this, and I do remember that we had this notion of we the people in order to perfect a more perfect union, in order to pursue a more perfect union, right? Uh, we the people, a more perfect union. And uh, I, I, I said, you know, I, I think that this conversation that we are having about how to split the resources of this bill can actually be the same kinds of conversations we're having about how to navigate the resources of society, how to split the resources of society, how to pay for things that we've done in society, right? We have some options there. We could just get out when you when you can. We could give everybody the same bill. We could give people who can pay more the opportunity to pay more. But all the things Brandon talked to me um, resonated with me with regards to how to uh, pay this bill. So before we get to the next slide, uh, let's just hop into the chat and Brendan will bring it up and we can talk. Um, has anybody ever been in a situation where uh, they were at a restaurant and they had to navigate this question of the common good, how to pay the bill in order to form a more perfect union? So uh, hop up in the chat and tell me, how did you guys resolve this conflict? Everybody uh, ordered some things. They went to a restaurant like Brennan and I did. And we're trying to figure out, right, who's going to pay this bill in what way? And, and what were some things that you guys did to navigate that? And then we'll kind of come back and tell you the way that Brandon taught us here at the Urban Assembly uh, how to navigate some of these challenges. Brandon, do you remember that time when we went to the restaurant that happened? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I, I vividly remember uh, that, that moment. Uh, yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, so we got, um, uh, we have uh, Malika. I had to eat my loss and pay. Next time I ordered separately, Valencia. Yeah, we just hope that the person with the highest salary offers to grab the check. <laughs> they don't talk about that. You know, he did say he was the CEO, right? You know, they just, just say. Um, but uh, someone calculates everyone's totals uh, from Jewel. Uh, uh, Dr. Phelps, uh, Venmo, yeah, Venmo, definitely, you know, technology has aided us in solving these problems a little bit as well. Um, uh, Sharon shares, put equal money into a dinner fund, then pull out each time we go to dinner. I, I like that. We might have to start I, that. I've not heard that before. I've not heard that. With Sharon, you, you, you have just shared a best practice that we may need to try. All right. Uh, You're going to uh, save uh, the Urban Assembly, Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's order was similar in cost, and we shared advertising, so we split in equal parts. Absolutely love that. Uh, jail, um, uh, bring in, bring it up and discuss who, how the bill will be paid before you even go out. Absolutely. Pre-planning pre is very important. Um, we have uh, Gerardo, uh, forget to invite some people next time. Mm. You know, I think about that on some trips that I've taken, you know, group trips. Like, I mean, we can't bring certain people. They just... They don't want to, you know, yeah, we've got to be able to spin a little bit. Um, Grace says, we split the bill by each order by person. What is more stressful in meal preparation to accommodate everyone's preference, especially picky kids? Mm. 
Absolutely. All credit cards in, waiter chooses who wins. Oh, oh well done. Credit card roulette, Brandon, you know, yeah, your wife, uh, your wife I, does I, not I like that. that. I, I'm telling you, I, I like Sharon's idea a little bit more because my wife would have yeah. something to say if I played <laughs> credit card roulette with the whole Urban Assembly. I love this. So we have some more. Keep coming in, David, but I know we uh, we have time so we can uh, we can go. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, so next slide. So thank you for all those opportunities. Thank you for all of that feedback. Uh, what Brandon taught us was he said, look, uh, there are some social emotional skills fo focus on social management. And uh, he didn't have an answer as to how to divide it. But he thought that if we all got into a room and we use these social emotional skills, uh, specifically in this case, accountable talk stems, we could come up with a way amongst ourselves to equitably address this situation in a constructive way. And so uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to kind of recreate that moment. Uh, but instead of talking about the bill, we're going to actually talk about the best color of all time. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use these accountable talk stems. And uh, Brandon's going to state his best color of all time. And I'm going to state my best color of all time. Um, and we're going to talk about how this can help build dialogue, reduce defensiveness, and help us come to a consensus around the common good. So, uh, Brandon, I'm just going to pull up my watch here. Um, and I remember you did this exercise with us. So uh, I know you know how to do this. Uh, but uh, I'm going to give us about two minutes. You're going to start off with the best color of all time. And we can only have this conversation using these accountable talk stems. So three, two, and one. I'd like to raise up that uh, purple is the best color of all time. I would like to say that black is the best color of all time. Uh, I think you need to maybe consider Prince Purple Rain. Purple is the best color of all time. I heard you say that Purple Rain uh, is uh, Prince's signature song, um, but I actually think that uh, Prince was not the best uh, person to talk about colors. There are all sorts of songs about colors. And and uh, there's a song by James Brown and he says, uh, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. So maybe consider that uh, James Brown has a little bit on Prince with regards to the best song of uh, color time. I respectfully disagree because one of the greatest movies of all time is The Color Purple. So purple is just intertwined in greatness across the board. Purple is the color of royalty. So I respectfully disagree. Well, tell me more about royalty, because uh, I think there are different kinds of royalty. And when it comes to Black royalty, you got Black Panther uh, and you got T'Challa. And uh, I'd like to hear more about your, your, your concern about royalty, considering that Black Panther is a great movie and he was royalty too. Well, I, I mean, I, I'd like to build on purple because purple, it just, it sits with me. And that's what I'm, that's what I like. That's what I believe. That's what I stand well, on. Well, maybe consider that Black can sit on you just as well. I mean, you are the founder of the Black Man Can. Uh, <laughs> and that might be another way to, to address and think about this situation. Well, tell me more about um, this color and, and, and how it can um, influence people. Because I believe that purple has um, the way to influence people to do things that you want to get them to do, even though you can't uh tell them to do it and we're at time all right <laughs> so uh we we complete this activity um we have one more activity and then we're gonna get your guys feedback in the chat uh so this is how brandon came to us and he said hey you know I try doing this and maybe you can come to a situation like what sharon did where we have a cool uh solution set to this problem next slide but he said, uh, if, if that doesn't work, I got another skill. And I said, you have two skills for us, Brandon? And he said, I'm the director of social emotional learning, right? I got these things. Uh, and so he said, this other skill is called active listening. And, and it's also under the social awareness category. It's designed to build trust and reduce misunderstanding. And it's focused on relationship building. Those show me what constructive relationships look, sound like, and feel like through their actions and their words, All right? And Brandon, we only have one minute for this. Uh, but, but I remember you talked about doing the best actor of all time. And so uh, what we're gonna do is the only thing we can say is what the other person said, paraphrase it and then say something else. So before you speak, you have to paraphrase what I say and vice versa. And we're gonna come to consensus on the best actor of all time. I'll start. Uh, the best actor of all time is clearly Morgan Freeman. Um, I, I, I heard you mention uh, Morgan Freeman um, and he definitely is, um, one of the ones, but I'd like to, I would like to raise up um, Will Smith 
uh, as uh, Mr. Hollywood, Mr. Fourth of July, I think that um, he may uh, overtake um, your actor. I heard you say that uh, Mr. Fourth of July is Will Smith, uh, but I'd like you to consider penguins, my friend. Penguins, uh, that was Morgan Freeman all the way. You know, I think uh, I, I heard you say penguins and, and you know, I, while, I, while, I, while, I, while I can uh, do appreciate Will Smith, but I, I appreciate that. And, and you know, I think I can raise up that Morgan Freeman's first acting role was when he was 47. So maybe why I can say he's, I can agree with you is because, uh, you know, that, that tells us to keep striving for our dreams. Great. And that is time. All right. So um, in the chat, please uh, just talk about some things you notice. We're actually going to move to the next slide and uh, Brendan's going to move those out. So uh, the point of these activities is to build bridges. Uh, notice it was constructing and not destructing. We're trying to understand what the other person is thinking, not impose our ideas. And so when we think about equity, we think about exchanging ideas and then coming to a common understanding of what we're trying to move together. So just like that, uh, that the bill at the, the restaurant, this is what we're trying to do. Next slide. All right, so finally, if we come together and we share ourselves by listening, we create these shared narratives, which, next slide, will bring us together and solve our problems. And that's what we did at the Urban Assembly. And that's what we can do in our societies, in our communities. Next slide. Thank you so much for the time today. David Adams, Chief Executive Officer at the Urban Assembly. Brandon Frame, Director of Social and Emotional Learning at the Urban Assembly. I'll turn it over back to you. Dr. Janice Phelps, thanks for having us here today. Wow, thank you so much, David and Brandon, for sharing your expertise with social emotional learning. Um, we really learned so much today, um, just so many takeaways, so many strategies that we can use in our classroom. So we just appreciate you coming all the way out here from New York to LA to be able to share those strategies with us. And really, I do walk away today knowing that all learning is social and emotional.